Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, it's an honor to have uh, Paxson Friedi here with us today. Um, uh, Paxson uh, did his undergrad uh, work at Caltech, working in Christoph Koch's lab, where he worked on the kinds of things that Christoph Koch is known to be interested in, visual attention and deep neural networks, uh, and then went off uh, to uh, join UCSD for his PhD work with uh, William Christan, uh, one of our long-term colleagues here we've been talking to for years about um, the kinds of things um, uh, that Paxton will talk about today as being possible. Um, the, the phrase that Bill and I came up with years ago was the whole idea of pursuing a computational microscope by analogy and by transition from light microscopy to electron microscopy, electron microscopy to computational microscopy where you have um, potentially noisy data coming in uh, in, uh, in high dimensional spaces and you want to sort of process it and visualize this in, in a new, with a new kind of uh, sets of views that collapse, clarify, compare, contrast, cluster, and that these kinds of new microscopes would be would be really critical one day to look for looking at neurobiological data, especially multi-neuron data, among other kinds of of, of uh, complex biological data. Um, and he's been working in Bill's lab uh, for for, uh, for several years now. Fin just finished his PhD work there in computational neuroscience. Um, I think. Um, Paxton was probably our first and only since then uh, neurobiology intern, and um, I guess second because we had, we had we had one right before that actually, but um, who actually went on to finish his PhD work and uh, um, and so it was it was fun having a summer of neurobiology with him here, uh, building tools and, and 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 tool kits that might one day be uh, the basis for computational microscopy, and I think that looking at his work and his recent um, 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 efforts and what happened over four years. I, I, I'm proud to think that some of his internship work was actually formative in some of the, the directions that he went. We'll be hearing about that today. Um, Paxson. Thanks, Art. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. I'm Paxson. I'm, uh, I'm in Bill Christon's lab at UC San Diego. Uh, and like Eric said, I'm going to be telling you about uh, this, this concept we call computational microscopy. And uh, you know, it, it's really it's really about uh, using machine learning and, and developing tools um, in an interactive way, uh, so that we can really try to understand complicated systems. And and the brain is just the key example of, of a complicated system. And and you know, we really need a lot of progress in in this type of technology to to move forward in understanding the brain. Um, so, so I just want to start with this really simple question. It's like, why is the brain so hard to understand? Why have we spent the last 100 plus years trying to figure this thing out and yet really made, you know, we still really don't even have a <laughs> sound theory about how the brain works at all. And, um, and I'm going to just blame uh, this thing we call reductionism. And... So we know the brain is very complex. Uh, it exists over a large number of scales. And so we, we can think all the way down to the, to the molecular nanometer size scale of synapses and how these are essentially the kind of foundational units of the brain up into neurons and small neural circuits, up into these complex hierarchies of different brain areas and to, into the entire brain itself. Um, and so, like bridging across these scales is is, is a huge technical challenge, um, and 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 using reductionism uh, is also just a has a philosophical problem. Um, so reductionism, we're taking this 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 complex system and we're breaking it apart, and and this has taken us a long way into understanding how the brain works. You know, we now know that there are synapses and there are neurons and, and these are all all the pieces we've, we've learned we've used reductionism to learn the pieces uh, but with the brain and with other complex systems it, you have to have no, no more than the pieces it's really also about how the pieces are put together and how they interact and so this this is like these types of questions are, are outside of the scope of reductionism and so that's why we need to uh, 
kind of develop these new technologies and, and experimental ideas to, to get, get past this and understand like how complexity emerges from organization. <clears throat> um, and so, so this has kind of been the foundation of, of the BRAIN initiative. And so this paper, which, which was called the BRAIN Activity Map Project, came out a few years ago just before the BRAIN initiative, uh, kind of pointing at this huge problem. And, and, and the very first quote that it starts off with um, is just talking about uh, this phenomenon of emergence and uh, how, how complexly uh, and new properties can appear when lots of pieces are put together. Um, and then along this type of, uh, these types of problems, we had this, this book, The Fourth Paradigm, that just kind of like came out when, when, I, when I first started here. And, um, and, and so, so this is uh, centered around using all this data, this new kind of revolution in big data, and how to harness that. And, and part of what the promise of big data is, is the ability to understand these complicated systems. And so, so, so when we were here at Microsoft, this is, this is Eric wrote in this book, this, this idea of a computational microscope and, and how to use these machine, machine learning tools to, to make sense of these big data problems. And, uh, and, and, and the Brain Initiative is also another push in this direction. And, uh, and in neuroscience, we're also kind of going through this big data revolution. We have uh, all these types of new techniques that, that enable us to record from uh, nervous systems at unprecedented scale and resolution. Um, so I'm going to tell you about voltage-sensitive dye imaging, um, uh, but there's other imaging modalities like calcium imaging and multi-unit electrode arrays. Um, and there's an even new technology like light sheet microscopy that's giving us even more neurons. So now we're so in the classical regime, we are doing electrophysiology. We could record from a couple of neurons. Maybe if you're bold, you could record from half a dozen neurons. And now at the turn of the 20th century, 21st century, we've, we've kind of entered into the next scale. So we're now at the dozens to hundreds of neurons scale with, with imaging. And then in the future, we're going to have to keep pushing. And, and then to get to the scale of the brain, the brain has 100 billion neurons. So we're, we're still a long way away. But, but just like approaching this first scale is, is, is a huge issue, and, uh, and, and it needs a lot of work. Um, so I think over the last few decades, we've, we've, we've started to realize something fundamentally important about how brains work and how neurons work. Um, and the insight is that um, in high dimensional space, uh, you can do a lot of powerful things in regards to computation. Uh, and so this is just um, these kind of, we have these chaotic neural networks now where if you just take a bunch of neurons and you randomly wire them together, uh, you can use their chaotic dynamics to, to learn arbitrary output patterns. And, and really the power of these simple things is just that these neural networks are so high dimensional that you can find a projection of them that gives you whatever pattern you want. Um, and so this is kind of illustrated in this little GIF where you know, we have information of these words. You know, words are these two-dimensional projections of information. But if they exist in a three-dimensional space, uh, we, can, we can look at them from different perspectives. And then the information is entirely different. right? So, so, so the word no and the word yes, it's just they're just they're, they're all, it's there always in this three-dimensional space, but, but the information just depends on which way you look at it. And so as we go up into higher and higher dimensions, to really understand these types of systems, we have to look at them from all sorts of different angles. And, uh, and that's what the computational microscope is, is supposed to do. <clears throat> so how do we explore uh, these high-dimensional systems? Uh, so we need lots of data. Um, and so I'm going to tell you about the voltage-sensitive dye recordings we've been doing that give us um, large-scale recordings of a nervous system. Uh, we want to have multiple behavioral outputs, so we want to see kind of a diverse array of complexity. Um, and then we want to be able to like, consolidate this across multiple experiments. Uh, okay. 
Um, so but then we need the algorithms also to, to make sense of this data. And uh, um, kind of the, two of the key things are, are going to be visualization so that we can see what we're looking at. Um, and then and what I call synthesis, uh, where we take new things and we put them together with old things and, and, and find the uh, canonical relationships. And then we also want it to be uh, scalable because we're just now broaching the beginning of what needs to be a long increase in, in scale. And as we keep going higher and higher in scale, we're going to need uh, machine learning and algorithms more and more. Um, and then and the other really important part of it is, is that we need um, real time and guided experiments. We need to be able to have these tools um, take in some data, give us some visualizations, and then use the tool to like tell us what to do next or what cell to target or what questions should we you know, try to figure out with our experiments in real time. <laughs> All right. So I work on the leech. Um, it's kind of a weird organism. And before I started grad school, I, I, wouldn't have, I didn't even know that was a <laughs> thing people studied. Uh, but, but it's actually a pretty amazing and beautiful organism. And it has you know, kind of its unique advantages over all, all the other model organisms that are out there in neuroscience. Um, so this picture is just from um, a course I, I teach uh, called Neural Systems and Behavior. And in this course, the, the students, they, they, they get to run through every organism that we, the kind of the main organisms we use in neuroscience. Uh, we have mice and um, electric fish, zebra fish, fruit flies, uh, the crab STG and leeches, and I think there's a C. elegans somewhere. Um, maybe that's a C. elegans. Uh, I, think, I think that was old, too old school. <laughs> Um, but but for, so for the leech, uh, I get a little bit more into its nervous system in, in just a second. But but essentially, it has you know these types of advantages. So it's extremely accessible. Uh, we can um, you, we can just like cut the brain out and and uh, and and get access to the nervous system. The nervous system is relatively relatively simple. It, it's only the hundreds of neurons scale. Um, uh, we can get access to it while it's still performing behavior. So the leech can perform an array of pretty interesting behaviors while we can monitor the nervous system. Um, it has defined cells. So, so across neuron, across brains, across leech brains, it actually has the same cells individually, cell by cell. And, it, and this is pretty unique for almost compared to any other organism. Um, and then another important thing is, is we can do electrophysiology. Um, so we can actually stick electrodes into cells and record voltage. Uh, whereas like in C. elegans, who's another simple organism, you actually can't do electrophysiology. They're just now getting electrophysiology in Drosophila. But their neuro Drosophila neurons are so tiny that if you try to stick an electrode in them, they essentially explode. But if you're really talented, you can, you can do it. And we also have these new voltage sensitive dyes, which gives us like a very unique perspective. So, so in, in the imaging world, uh, almost everyone images with calcium, and this is kind of the second messenger of voltage, and everyone really wants voltage. But, but in, in, in the leech, we now have this new technology that allows us to image voltage directly. Okay, so this is what a leech looks like. It's just a segmented worm, anterior, posterior end. Um, if you stimulate it in different behaviors, you can get uh, I mean, if you stimulate it in different places, you can get different behaviors. So uh, if you kind of shock it or poke it in the anterior end, it will perform this behavior called shortening, where it kind of withdraws. Uh, if you shock it in the back, it'll try to swim away. And so this is just like the sine wave muscle oscillation it uses to propel itself through the water. And then if you kind of apply a light stimulus somewhere to the middle of the body, it does this uh, aversive reflex called local bending. Um, so the way we've, we've studied these behaviors over the years is, is what you do is first you take a full leech and then you just watch the behavior and you kind of, maybe you attach beads to the leech and, and look at the beads and kind of get the kinema kinematics of its movements. Um, and then you can do these cool things where, you know, this is what my advisor got kind of famous on. 
uh, where you can actually cut out uh, like part of the animal to expose the nervous system. And then you can do recordings from the nervous system while the front and back half of the animal are still fully intact. So, so you can, <laughs> Bill will do this exper experiment at Anderson B every year and, and uh, you, know, you can see this leech like get shocked and then the front and back halves are trying to like swim away while the middle of it's just sitting there <laughs> spitting out action potentials. Um, so this is kind of how we've, we've been able to relate you know, the behaviors to the motor neuron outputs. And, uh, and then for more complicated things uh, like imaging, you can't really have the animal flopping around or, or, or everything's going to be ruined. So, but you can essentially just take out the entire nervous system, take away all the muscles, and, and the animal still performs these behaviors. Um, and so, so we can still sh just shock the nervous system and get swimming, and, and then at the same time image one of the ganglia with, with voltage dyes. So, um, so the Lita's nervous system is, is made out of a head brain and a tail brain, and then this repeating structure we call a ganglion. So there, and there's 21 of them in the midbody. Um, so all in all, there's about 10,000 neurons uh, in the whole nervous system. But what's really cool is that each of these ganglia appears to be the same structure of 400 neurons, just repeat it. And even the head and tail brain appear to be ganglia just fused together over the course of evolution. And so we think that the leech's brain is made up of this one core structure made up of about only 400 neurons. And so we are trying to just map this one core structure. All right, so to, to do this, I'm going to image from this particular ganglion, ganglion 10. And then I'm going to be recording throughout the animal um, different extracellular uh, nerves that go, these, these nerves go off to the muscle. So this, this is a behavioral readout, so I can record what the motor neurons are doing, as well as, as input. So I can stimulate these nerves to kind of stimulate the, the animal in different places um, and activate the different behaviors. Uh, so, then, and then, so this is what just a single ganglion looks like. So this is just, this is the ventral face of one of these ganglion. There's also a dorsal face, and then so there's the cell bodies on the ventral face, cell bodies on the dorsal face, and in between the two layers of cell body is, is where the leached nervous system makes all its synaptic connections. <clears throat> so in this picture, um, all these colored cells are, are, are the cells we've known about that over the last 50 or 60 years of leached neurophysiology, we've, we've uncovered these colored cells, mostly the sensory and, and some motor neurons. Um, but then the vast majority of the rest of the cells are, are white because we don't really know anything about them. And actually, the white cells are highly underrepresented in this, this uh, diagram. So, so we only know about a third of the cells so far. Um, right, and so to activate the different behaviors, uh, we can just shock the nervous system. So to get shortening, you can shock either one of these anterior nerves um, to get uh, the local bend response. I actually uh, uh, target this sensory P cell and, and activate the sensory P cell. And we know this activates the local bend reflex. And then to get swimming, we stimulate these nerves back here posteriorly. And so, so, the, so the whole nervous system will generate all these behaviors without any muscles attached. And so, so we call these fictive behaviors. Um, yeah. uh, so, so like I said, there's, there's only about a third of the neurons uh, that have been identified. Um, and so, so some of them you can identify just by looking at them. So, so these two retzius cells, these two R cells, uh, they're, they're by far the biggest cell in the ganglion. They're always like sitting right here. And so you can just see by eye, you can know that they're the Retzia cells. Uh, but then, you know, I, I, I kind of grayed out the sensory neurons over here. So there's this, this line of sensory neurons. Uh, but you can't necessarily distinguish them by eye. Okay, so you can, you can guess that, like, these pretty largest shells over here, some of them are sensory neurons. Like, this might be an N or it might be a P or a T. Uh, but you can't tell just by eye. But unfortunately, what you can do is... Uh, 
stick an electrode in and, and record their action potentials. And so, so a lot of cells have these unique action potential shapes. So like the T cells are kind of bursty, the N cells have these really long after hyperpolarizations. So, th so they have unique defining characteristics and that allows people to study them experimentally because you can reliably identify them across animals. And there's a handful of other cells that have kind of these unique action potentials like the S cell. Um, but the vast majority of the other cells, uh, they, there's nothing really that characteristic about them. Um, you see these kind of little dinky action potentials, uh, but, but there's nothing really obvious. Um, and, and the way that the, the techniques we use to identify the rest of the neurons re rely on, on observing what they're doing during these different behaviors um, or, but, or some other kind of complex way of distinguishing them from other neurons. Um, uh, but, the, but this is hard to kind of do at scale. And, uh, and, and, and so, but we can use voltage sensitive dye imaging to actually kind of solve this problem. And so we can record from you know, almost all of these cells all at once uh, while they're each doing individual behaviors and use that to, to distinguish the, the cells. Um, so, so we use um, a voltage sensitive dye to, to record from these neurons. I'm not gonna like go into the mechanism of it, but essentially the dye gives us these amazing recordings. So, so here, are, these are optical traces. So we actually can see individual action potentials in these optical traces. Um, we can see these large bursts. So these are um, little five millivolt spikes in this particular cell. And then we can even see uh, oscillation. So, so down here in black is um, an intracellular voltage recording, and then in green is an optical recording. And so even the cell that's oscillating about three or five millivolts during swimming, even this little oscillation you can pick up on the voltage die or like little sub-threshold synaptic potentials. So we have this new voltage die that gives us, you know, an unprecedented resolution. Oh, sorry, back to the yep. one that's not actual potential, that's actually just voltage? Yeah, so this is just like, uh, so a lot of the cells... Just, just change voltage levels, basically. Right, so, so they're, so, so, so the, voltage. unlike most neurons, the, the, the leech neurons are all monopolar. So the soma is like way out here and they send the little process down into the neuropil and then they make all their synaptic connections and that generate the axons out here. I mean, generate action potentials out here. So, so what you record at the soma is, is a very filtered action potential. Yeah, so, so, so a lot of times you can't even see them and, and you see just like the slow membrane oscillation. For many bursts, for example, downtime speed. Right. Yeah. Um, oops. Okay. This slide got messed up. Um, okay. Well, anyway. So the uh, the way I kind of envision this, uh, the kind of the idea of the computational microscope, is to like go from here where we have just an experiment. Uh, we collect some raw imaging data. Uh, we transform that into cell-by-cell -cell data. And then we're going to transform that into like characteristic features. And then we're going to consolidate this into some kind of canonical framework, or like the homologs of, of the same cells. And, and I kind of like to think of this as like, like a deep neural network kind of, where you know, we have like, these are just different layers. And so this is like, you know, 10,000 dimensional feature space. This is like a hundred dimensional feature space. And then this is like a 10 dimensional feature space. And then we do some clustering here to come up with some canonical form formation. And, uh, and this kind of process is what I call the, the imaging computational microscope. Um, okay, so the first, uh, the first step um, is to take a uh, raw movie, so just like pixels in an image uh, in a bunch of frames, um, and turn that into uh, individual cellular components. And uh, so here's, here's like an old kind of screenshot of, of what this MATLAB GUI looks like. Um, uh, so essentially like here's just like some raw data over here, 
yeah, I've selected this particular ROI. Um, so up here is uh, just like exactly what the, uh, the ROI is over time. So it's like the average within the ROI over all frames. Um, and so you can see this cell spiking. Um, and, and down here is, is actually like the automatically extracted component that corresponds to this ROI. And so all these ROIs are actually generated automatically. Um, so I'm going to tell you how that works now. Um, so, um, so, so the first thing you do is, is you take your image and we're going to try to reduce the dimensionality down and we're just going to use uh, PCA. Um, the other thing that I've already done is um, I've taken all of the data. So in all these data, I'll have multiple trials. So I have multiple trials of shortening, multiple trials of swimming. Um, and so that so each trial is like, you know, a 10 second long movie. Um, so what I've done is, is I've used a image registration algorithm to actually align all the trials up and pretend like everything's just like a single time series. Okay, so I just have this one big movie. Um, so then like, so you do PCA on the individual pixels of this big movie, um, and then you get uh, two things out. So you get a map, um, and you get uh, uh, sources. So, so here, since I have several trials in this one movie, the map is going to be the same for all the trials. Um, but then these traces can be just broken back up into the individual trials. So, so, so for a single animal, then you'll have um, you'll do PCA, and then each component will have a map, and then it'll have multiple traces, and then the number of traces are just the same number of trials. Okay, so we're mainly going to use PCA to reduce the dimensionality. PCA doesn't like tell us a lot about like what's in the data. Usually, if you just look at these these maps, what you see is is, is these mixtures of cells, and that's just because you know PCA is optim is just looking at volume and mixtures of cells is just louder than individual cells. Um, but there's this algorithm called ICA, um, which, which looks for independence. And uh, this will pull out um, signals that we're interested in. Um, and so most of the time, what you'll see is something like this, where you have this kind of localized spatial region. And then you have these traces corresponding to the activity at that region. And then, so this is like pulling out an individual cell. And so here's just another cell. And so, so here, this is, this is actually two different trials. So one trial is swimming and the cell oscillates. And this other trial is shortening and doesn't do any, it just does this early part. Um, but ICA, uh, but these algorithms are, are, are just, they're completely naive to like what you're telling it. And, and they, they don't know the difference between a cell and an artifact. But what's really nice about ICA is it actually like will extract and separate um, cellular components and artifactual components. And then in the GUI, you can go in, manipulate the parameters, all these kind of magic numbers, like the dimensionality of your PCA, and, and, and toy with it until you have something that you like. And then you also can then manually kind of remove these components that you don't want. Um, so then after you've removed the artifacts, uh, there's a segmentation stage, essentially just applying a threshold to these ICA maps to kind of get a binary mask. Um, and then occasionally the ICA will actually uh, cluster cells together into a single component. Uh, so in this case, uh, there are these two bilateral cells, uh, and they essentially fi are firing spike for spike because they're strongly electrically coupled to each other. And so ICA just, just thinks they're the same cell because their activity is the same, right? And so maybe you can use spatial segmentation just to, to, to break them apart again. Um, and then that generates a bunch of ROIs. Um, and finally, there's sometimes it does the opposite thing of this where it, it breaks apart individual cells. And again, you can just use the GUI to put them back together. So that's like how we get the data out. Um, and next, we're going to try to uh, to describe the individual cell data with a handful of features. Um, but first, let me let me just show you kind of like what the data looks like. All right. So here's just a movie of shortening. Let's see. All 
all right, so this is kind of false colored. Um, but effectively, you, you hear the stimulus come on. And then you'll see a bunch of cells like turn green and red. So green just means it's depolarizing, and red means they're hyperpolarizing. If you look really closely, right after the stimulus, you'll see this kind of flash of green, and then and then this slower like flash of red. This is real time, yes. All right, it might be slowed down. So a lot of a lot of stuff is happening, right? Delta activity you see after the after the actual um, signals input to the system. So you're explicitly looking at change. Right. Yes. So so, so all of the well, well, optical. You see color all the time, right? For yeah, the, but the optical recordings are always relative. So you can't like you can't get the absolute voltage values. Right. So you're conditioning on on this background. Right. Uh, stabilize and then do the. And then it changes. And then watch the change. Right. Yep. Um. Right, so yeah, so for shortening, you see a, a bunch of different types of responses, right? So, so some cells go up, some cells kind of go down, some cells like go up and then down, some cells have this late phase, some cells very early. Uh, but really, like these, all these responses can can be pretty well characterized by uh, these two factors, or you can think about these as the principal components. Um, so essentially, there's uh, Factor one, which is this slower component, which corresponds to cells kind of going, getting depolarized or hyperpolarized um, in conjunction with the actual motor output. And then there's this factor two, which is this fast component, which is uh, cells mainly getting depolarized uh, due to the stimulus. Um, so then you can, you fit these factors onto all of these traces and you can get coefficients and then we can plot all the individual cells into these two dimensions. Um, and then I can give the cells colors just based on where these coefficients are, and then use the ICA maps, color the maps, and create this activity map. And so with the activity map, we can kind of get a visual sense of what the cells are doing, because now we can, we can you know, plot ten di I mean, four dimensions here, like two for space and color representing these two shortening factors. So now we're just we're kind of characterizing the cells with these this low dimensional representation. All right, so here's swimming. Okay, so swimming is this repetitive motor burst. So the leech is doing this sine wave oscillation through the water. Um, and then, so what you can see is a bunch of cells that oscillate with this motor bear. So this is like the easiest, the most obvious one. And they're all the circles oscillate. Um, so you just see it going red to green, red to green, red to green. And then if you look at a different circle, you know, if you look at this yellow circle, you'll see it, it oscillating too, but it's actually at a different phase. Um, so, so to characterize swimming, we're going to do what we call just some um, a coherence analysis. Uh, so you know, so here's this this motor, this repetitive motor neuron output burst, um, and then here are a bunch of different cells in the voltage dyes oscillating um, with this motor neuron burst. And so we do the correlation in Fourier space, which tells us um, a correlation magnitude and phase. So this is just giving us now another two dimensions to just to characterize these oscillations. And so you can see a bunch of different cells are oscillating in different phases. And then give these phases a color. And again, you can make an activity map and get a visualization of what the cells are doing during swimming. Okay, And then for local bending, we're going to do this same analysis. So in the local bending experiments, I'm actually just activating uh, this sensory P cell at a repetitive uh, input, so this is just like a half a hertz stimulus input, and then I'm co measuring the coherence between this two hertz stimulus and the rest of the voltage dyes. And so you effectively it pulls out cells in this pink phase, which are getting depolarized by the stimulus, and cells in this cyan phase, which are getting uh, hyperpolarized. And again, we can make an activity map and get visualization.
So, um, so the important thing to, to make sure that's true is, is to make sure that like the ganglion across trials, so this individual animal performing shortening, it, it, that the neurons do something consistent, or at least some of them are consistent, right? So, so it wouldn't be very useful if the neurons were doing different things on every trial of shortening because you couldn't really use that to identify them. And so here I'm just um, going to show you like some visualizations to get a sense of the variability across animals and across trials. Um, so each of these uh, four boxes is from a different animal. And then for each animal, there's two trials of shortening being shown. Okay? So these are just two separate trials. And you can see like the activity maps. And so, so you can see across individual trials that they're, they're really similar. Okay, and then over here are just the, uh, the, the same coefficients that I described to you just a second ago. So, so for one trial, I've fitted those factors and to every trace, and that gives me one end of each of these line segments. And then for another trial, I fit the factors again, and it gives me the other end. So each line segment is the activity of a single cell across two trials, right? So the start and end indicate what this, the, the, that single cell is doing across these two different trials. Right? And so then the, the size and the kind of isolation of the line segment is an indicator of how consistent that cell was across trials and how different it was from other cells. So, so small, isolated line segments mean that we have a lot of identifying information. <laughs> and then just visually, you can kind of look across animals and get an appreciation that like the ganglion uh, uh, during shortening is effectively doing something pretty similar. And so that, that's, that's good because we need, you know, across animals for the neurons to be doing similar things during these behaviors. <clears throat> yeah? Just if you have enough to, to be able to appreciate what, what is good in here, what, what would happen, how would it look the picture if you had, uh, say, the same animal performing a different uh, action, so swimming versus some other thing? Would you see a very different picture? So you mean like if you were, if you applied this? This is, not, this is kind of qualitative, right? It's not quantitative, and, and you know I'm trying to. Use, so, you know, you you make the claim that this this is reproducible. So, if we would have had, you know, if we had one image in which it was swimming and the other image in which it was performing some some other action. Uh, we expect to see that we'll have long lines, right? Right. Very long yeah. lines and stuff like that. Do you have something like that? That uh, no, I've never. I mean, I've never really even thought of trying to like do that. But I mean, so here. I mean, so here's swimming, right? So. <laughs> no, again, it's swimming against. But, but, but yeah, like comparing it across. I mean, what it would look like is that, you know, so in one trial you would have. Something that if you, were, you did the swim analysis on like a swim, it, it looks like this, right? You have, you have a bunch of neurons that are significantly coherent. If you do, if you try to do this analysis on a shortening, like nothing's oscillating, everything's gonna just be clumped in the middle like this. So, like, all the lines will, like, will be lines out here pointing into the middle like this. Like, I will like, radiate like that. Um, Mm -hmm. It's just, just beautiful and remarkable work, I think. Did, but I'm curious if you showed this to like Bill Fishman on your committee and your advisor or other neurobiologists. Mm -hmm. um, it'd be kind of interesting to, interesting to know what kind of insights and answers to questions that, that they've held for a long time might, might come to their minds for like, you know, helping the, the traditional people in this field who are looking for who have like standing questions. Um, because it's first step to start visualizing it's beautiful. We can, we can say lots of things about homologs across animals, for example. But I, I wonder if we, if some of the questions I know that Bill has had about circuits, for example, and circuitry, mm -hmm. could be answered um, directly by inspection of various of these of these visualizations. Yeah. Um, I, obviously, this is, this is a step towards that, right? This is a step towards. Um, you show that. visualizations. What one, one reaction is? Okay, how are they? They're beautiful, and I, I see lots of things going on. And I, I can learn many things, including 
maybe the personality of, of a cell and the match of a cell be, uh, among animals, which is something we all looked at here. But I'm just curious if other questions came up in, uh, over time that people said, wow, I, if I had just had this one new functionality here, or, or I'm seeing something about these two cells that makes me think they're, they're linked in an interesting way beyond 90 degrees or out of phase, for example. Yeah, um, so one of, the, one of the, I guess, things that stands out along these lines, maybe a little different than what you're saying, but um, is that the cells, I mean, are the cell, does the same cell, like across behaviors, does the same cell do correlated things? Or, so, so if you're in, you know, if you're in this phase of swimming, does that imply you're over here during shortening, or are these things independent, right? And, and that, that goes to a long way in talking about how neurons encode information uh, about like what they're doing and what they're sensing. And, and I think you know, a big thing in the field now is that uh, you, you have these neurons that are, are multifunctional, that, like, that have these, that really are kind of representing these joint uh, uh, Features and 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 for whatever and, and well probably I mean there's computational theoretical reasons like having every neuron try to be as independent as possible you, you know is something to go for so so then observing the same neurons doing a bunch of different behaviors and what you see is that like there's there's there, there's only a handful of cases where like they're really correlated about across behaviors and actually I think pulling out those correlations tells you tells you some of the structure that you're you're talking about. Um, and then when I think when I get to the preparatory network too, that will also uh, be like some illumination. So when I look at these images, there are differences between animals, right? Mm -hmm. Like different um, types of animals. Like if you look at the animals that are in the animal kingdom, like birds and birds, the left and right image are more similar because they belong to the same animal. Than yes. So these two cells are this. See, the, I mean, these two are the same animal. Same animal. Do you? Do you know or speculate about the differences between animals? Does it stem from um, structure differences between animals, or there are just random formation differences, or these are more like the way they initiate these swimming patterns are different between animals? Do you know where the variation comes from? Um, yeah, so there's certainly variation. Um, but really, like, it's remarkably consistent, and uh, and so its consistency can be expressed in in that set of cells that we've already identified. And so, if you open up any leech ganglion, you can like immediately find the red cell cells, the P cells, a bunch of motor neurons. Um, and 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 so, for this about a third of the cells that we have we've identified so far, they're always there and they're always in the same function. So there's definitely slight variability in exactly how the ganglion puts together. And that's actually why, I actually didn't mention this, but like the, I mean, the reason you can't just like solely rely on where the cells are is because there is like this anatomical variability. Sometimes the cells get pushed around, right? And even sometimes I'm like doing this dissection, I, you know, stab it or something, or like I have to cut off this little tiny capsule and, and so the cells can move around and the, 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 the capsule is actually like kind of compressing, holding cells, and so when I cut it off, they kind of like, expand out. Uh, so there's like slight anatomical variability. And so, so that, that, I mean, that's what makes it hard to identify the cells too. Um, but as far as like there being functional variability or like there being learning or something environment dependent, uh, it, it's not really entirely clear. It, it, everything we've studied so far points to no, but we're kind of biased because we've mainly only studied the sensory and motor neurons and perhaps you know, there's a, this huge array of interneurons, and that that kind of space is more flexible. Um, that that's not that, that that's not entirely clear. But like from this work, it seems like all these cells seem to be very consistent as well. Um, so it seems like the animal has this pretty well-defined functional homology. Um, so yeah, so swimming. Um, so again, this is is the same. Ideas before there's two trials of swimming, <coughs> and then each cell has a line segment indicating the each of these two trials, and so as you can see, swimming is like remarkable. Um, it, there's all, a bunch of line segments; they're really well spread out 
around the outside edges, and they're very short. Um, so swimming is a very promising feature for identifying cells. And then here's the same thing with local bending. Um, and so, so mainly what you see across local bending is, is, is essentially this one axis. So, so there's these pink cells which are getting depolarized and these kind of cyan or green cells which are getting hyperpolarized. But again, there, I mean, at least at these extremes, uh, there seem to be you know, a handful of lines or so that are, are pretty well uh, isolated. Okay. Okay. So then the final, uh, the final thing, the final step is, uh, is 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 taking all these animals and putting them into like a single canonical uh, representation. Um, and so here's kind of you know the the gist of the strategy, right? So, so if we just like zoom in on these these five cells, okay. Um, so, so based on just their position and their size, you couldn't really distinguish, distinguish them from each other, right? So they're, they're too close together. There's nothing really characteristic about them. But then if you do you know, shortening and you, you get these shortening features, then they start to get separated. So now you can tell like one from five and five from two and three, right? But you can't really distinguish between two and three. So they're still, they're doing the same thing and they're in the same place, so you can't really distinguish them. And then if you look at swimming, you know, you kind of get the same gist, right? So, so you can, you know, seeing swimming helps you kind of distinguish some of them, but then maybe not all of them from each other, right? So now we can't distinguish between two and four and three and five because they're in the same place, they're doing the same thing. But by like combining all these features, uh, you know, we're creating this like higher dimensional feature space and then this allows separation of all the cells individually. So, so this is our strategy. So we're gonna we're gonna take all a, we're gonna make a ten-dimensional feature space. Okay, so we're gonna have two for the position of the, so, the cells, two just indicating the size of the cells, and then uh, and then two more for each of these three behaviors. And then we're gonna so that's gonna be our canonical feature space. <clears throat> so then with the Shish and Eric, we kind of develop these. Ideas, um, uh, yeah, it's a long time ago. <laughs> um, and so, so we we developed. <laughs> Back in the sixties, <laughs> rebels. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so again, there's we have this uh, another interface that. Uh, that kind of lets you explore these, compare these all these feature maps, um, and then uh, explore this feature space, and and, uh, and then we have a couple of machine learning algorithms that that can manipulate the feature space to 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 kind of accent certain things. So so we, we so there's like this is an iterative kind of strategy. Okay, so essentially the idea is is like we'll have these we're comparing these two animals. So this is animal H, this is animal C. And then, um, and so here are just like the activity maps, just so if you want to like reference that. Um, so then in animal C, I'm going to select uh, three cells manually and just indicate it by these three ROIs. And then the algorithm is going to is going to use like the Hungarian algorithm, for instance, in this particular case, to guess which cells are homologous in this other animal. So, so the the computer has told me that it thinks. Uh, this cell is the green cell, this cell is the blue cell, corresponding blue cell, and this red cell is the corresponding red cell. And then it also shows me, as a, in this color heat map, uh, the kind of relationships. So, so the brighter green uh, indicates that these, cell, these other cells are, are more like this. So, so this is like the distance in this 10-dimensional feature space uh, that all these cells are away from this particular green cell. And so, so we can essentially visualize this high-dimensional space by, by like picking a cell, and then you can see uh, the cells that are similar to it. And so that gives you an idea of like what are the possible homologs. Okay. So then um, we can then tell the computer that 
uh, oh, I'm, I'm very confident that these cells are matches, and I'm very confident that these cells are matches. And then based on these matches, uh, we develop some like learning algorithms that warp the feature space to kind of accent the important features. So, so just as, this is just the very simplest uh, version of the algorithm. Um, but effectively, what you can see is, so here's just like the normal, regular feature space for these two animals. So, so this, this plot over here is, is indicating the position of the cells. This is indicating the shortening factors. This is indicating the local bin coherence. And this is indicating the swim coherence. And so this is just like what, what it looks like when you don't do anything. You're just plugging in the, the features. OK? So then after warping, um, we've, so I've assigned, so there's really eight different animals in this data set. And then I've gone through and I've assigned matches across all these different eight animals. And then um, in, in this iterative procedure, once I assign matches, this algorithm can show me this warp distance space. And that kind of emphasizes the features that are important for the matches, right? So, so, so it kind of and it, and it ends up showing you kind of what our visual intuitions that led us to believe earlier. So, so position um, gets kind of stretched out. Swimming gets a little stretched out, and so the, those those feature dimensions are emphasized. Whereas uh, shortening kind of gets squashed because it's not quite as distinguishing. Um, and then local bending gets squished along this one axis. And like, as we saw, there's essentially this just one dimension of local bending that was informative. So then this just like, gives us ways to use machine learning to kind of like, warp the feature space and, and, and pull out the things that are more interesting and relevant. And, and, and this is how we kind of explore this, this high dimensional space. And then here's like, some, some GIFs. So, so this is just a like, kind of show you, give you like some visual sense of what's happening. Um, so then, so this is like the principal components of the, the uh, 10 dimensional feature space. And then every single cell that I've matched across eight animals are shown. Okay, and then, and then, they're, then, then, then so each cell that's in a single cluster is, 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 is colored the same and connected by a little uh, convex hull. Uh, and so, like, I, mean, I mean, the point of this is really just you can see that you know, after doing this, this warping algorithm that the clusters come out much more nicely and that you can, uh, you, you can start to tease apart the clusters of cells, cells a little bit better. And, 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 and you know, really, like, there's a lot of corruption in the feature space, right? Like some, you know, the position of the ganglion, like some ganglions are just like oriented like this a little bit relative to others. So just like kind of compensating for those minor changes uh, can take you a long way in, in cleaning up uh, this high dimensional space. And then from also from this, you can, uh, you can really get a sense of like which cells are, you're going to get confused. So, so like the nut and the AE cells are kind of like in the same cluster, but uh, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to understand <laughs> how to separate them because I'm, I'm, I'm not just solely relying on this to do the clustering, right? I'm, I'm also going in and visually assigning these matches. So, so this is like both, you know, this algorithm and my own like refinement. Um, so, so this is so then this gives us all these cells, um, and now I'm going to kind of describe like the canonical uh, set of cells. So, um, so this is I'm going to this is like an entry. Um, I'm going to show you for a single cell. Um, so this particular cell is called 151. It's just numbered based on this standard number system that the Leech community has developed. And then again, we have uh, the position, shortening, local bend, and swimming uh, features plotted here. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's exactly what I was about to say. So these eight circles. Uh, correspond to the eight animals that are in this experimental data set. And then the, the fill-in just indicates which experiments this particular cell was, was seen. Okay, so, so cross experiments, we're only going to see, we're not necessarily going to see all the cells. We're going to see some subset of the cells. Just because there's anatomical difference, sometimes it's just due to the dye not giving enough signal. 
Um, and then, so, so this just tells us which experiments um, the cell was found. And then these circles tell you where the cells were. This tells you what it does during shortening. This tells you that, so this cell like has a big fast component and a pretty large depolarization with a motor neuron. Um, and this cell almost always uh, gets excited by P-cell stimulus. It like, got inhibited one time. And then it, it typically oscillates in this red phase during swimming. Okay? So that's just kind of how you read this table. So here's another, just another cell. So this cell is down here, kind of posterior lateral. So this cell um, gets inhibited and in hyperpolarized during shortening. It, it has both kinds of responses during relocal bending, and then it, it oscillates in this kind of green cyan phase. And so, so here's just like the whole table of cells that we were able to uh, identify across animals. Um, so uh, almost all of them are swim oscillators. Um, the only ones that aren't are indicated by these asterisks. Um, and then I have kind of outlined in yellow uh, these particular cells which, which share a kind of interesting set of features. And so, so like you were kind of saying earlier how you know, these features, you know, there's computational reasons why the nervous system would want to to make its feature representation independent. Uh, but then sometimes uh, the features come out to be correlated. And I think this points at like some intrinsic structure. So, so, so this, this yellow network uh, is what I call the preparatory network. And uh, you can kind of see it has this characteristic two things. So one is that during local bending, it's excited by uh, the P cell stimulus. So it's directly excited by sensory input. And then during shortening, uh, it has this, this big fast component. Okay? So this AP cell is kind of the, the mother of, of this network. And, and so you see this big fast component. So it has this rapid depolarization during shortening, and it has direct sensory uh, input. Um, yeah, so then this is just the canonical maps of these networks. Um, um, but so then. I went in and, and looked at the preparatory network much more closely. Um, and so in this case, uh, um, if you remember, I'm always imaging from ganglion 10. But then I'm going to be stimulating different ganglion to, different, to elicit these different behaviors. Okay? So just depending on how far away the ganglia I stimulate, uh, uh, that it, will it will take longer for the cells to depolarize. right? So here, so here in the bottom row, it makes a little more sense. So, so, they're, so the ganglia are just sorted by how far away they are from ganglion 10, right? And so you can see, and then I would go in, and then you can find these like inflection points where the cells depolarize, and you can just like mark the beginning of these, uh, these depolarizations, right? And that, that kind of tells you the, the timing of the response. Um, and so remember that like the you know, 14 and 17 in tail are eliciting swimming, and, and then 7 and 3 are eliciting shortening. And so you can see that, like, these neurons, you know, they don't really look different based on the ganglion. The timing is a slightly slower, but, you know, it's effectively always depolarizing. Okay? So then, I, so then here are just, like, three examples from cells that, that are in the preparatory network. And then just, just here's uh, some other cells that are not in the preparatory network in the same kind of gist. Um, <laughs> so this is the network that, that is in the literature that... No, that, that. this is not in the literature. So, what's the, so what do you mean by prep network? Uh, so what I, I'm, I'm trying, yeah, so I mean, the, the, this is why we call it the preparatory network. I mean, the, the first thing is that um, it's rapid, right? It's receiving rapid input oh, from see. every behavior, okay. right? And, and so... Like, so, so this is showing us it's rapid not only during shortening, which we kind of got from the factor two, but, it, but also it's rapid now from swimming as well. Um, and it's also receiving sensory input so directly. Between cells in one network and another based on the yeah, because they had shared this like common feature dimension, we like so started looking at it. When it comes to single cells and homologs, um, 
how could we do a richer categorizations of sets of cells that might be um, in the same phase? Right. Among, yes. other, among, other, among, among other, other shared attributes. Yes. And, um, and, and then, then once you have them, you can say, what are the properties does this, does this set have? I guess my question would be, you're calling it network versus set of cells. And so the question is, what, 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 what gives you the, the, the sense you can call it a network? Besides the fact that everything is connected eventually. So, well, I, so, so, I, I, I'm, so now that we have this hypothesis for the preparatory network and the ability to use this computational microscope in real time, I can go into a new animal, <laughs> I can identify the preparatory network, and then I can target it and do more experiments. And right. so that's where I'm heading with this. Okay? So, so this is still, I'm still just trying to establish like, why, why I'm calling the preparatory right. network. And, and, and so, the, so mainly, uh, yeah, so then, so we can, uh, uh, you can just like fit these response curves based on distances, right? And, then, and so then you can see, what you can see is like, if you plot the, you know, the response times of all the preparatory cells, you see that like, it's just, they're all faster than in this blue clump, which are just another handful of cells that I've chosen out of the cells I've identified. So like the preparatory network is like consistently fast and it has nothing to do with behavior. And, and it essentially looks the same across animals too. So, so the reason, that's just like how far away the stimulus is from ganglion 10. So how can this problem decision making? Yeah, so, well, I, I mean, so this is like something that Bill uh, like kind of hypothesized a long time ago that, that, that the sequence is more like, there's a stimulus, do something. There's like, he called it the do something network, just like get ready maybe like prime the muscles, and then there's like the decision, and then there's the actual execution of the behavior. So this is just to do something. That's what I think. So, because it's it, it, like there's no real behavioral defining thing, right? So it's just, it's all about the stimulus, and, and, it, and it looks the same regardless of the behavior, right? Even just local activating sensory cells like activates this, this similar network. Yeah. Yes. Consistent, what do you mean by consistent? I mean, it's just like, it's the same cells regardless of their behavior. So like, you know, so, so this is oh, all one animal. Thing, yeah, and these are cross behaviors. Yeah. So like, so, they, so these are just the, yeah, the fast, the time, onset times during these behaviors of these cells. Right. You cannot distinguish the behavior, but you can see them firing up every time. Right. The you, yeah, I don't, you, you can't tell what behavior is going to happen from just the preparatory wait, network. Wait, 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 you could, um, just suggest where you look to see what, what the differences are in the decision. Yeah. So if, you, if you basically know that there's some prep going on, and you, you hypothesize that that was some sort of a queuing up of like do something. You think something about the prep or its end, which would show you a little bit more about the do something. I mean, I mean what, what, what it is to do. Words, yeah, we don't know. It would give you some sort of a queuing frame to, to look for the differences. Right. Some sort of like Look over here now as this, as the, uh, or actually compare more deeply the difference between the prep uh, activities for different behaviors downstream. Because maybe the yeah. behaviors show earlier in the, uh, the prep level. Yeah, it's possible. Prep, but it's really, really, this is really a decision made, being made. Maybe. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah, so then, I mean, so then. The really important part of the computational microscope is to like close the loop. It's like, this is our dream, the yeah. BOI dream. Yeah. And so, so this is like kind of what we call, you know, computationally guided experiments or computationally guided electrophysiology. And so, you know, so this, this is just like a verification study. So, you know, I like find a new animal and then I generate this swim activity map and that allows me to identify a, cup, a handful of swim oscillators and then I can go in and target them. And so I just, I'm just trying to you know, verify that these cells are really doing what I, the voltage dyes say they're doing and it turns out you know, essentially yes. Like, so I can, I can now come and have a new animal. I can you know, image a trial of swimming, do this analysis, produce the canonical relationships and then you know target these cells specifically for further experiments. And so so, so there's just three so, sorry, so, so you're saying that this 
get a slower here. So mm -hmm. you get the new animal, you have your old data set, you have your old analysis, and it's get, and then it's going to be able to image it, and it's going to look at the analysis and tell you the cell number. Yeah, it's going to like say, I think that this component, and you know, this component is closest to in the feature space to this cell that we've seen already, like 152, right? And then, and then the computer will tell, can tell me like what it thinks the cells are, and then I can go yeah. and target them. I mean, the, the interesting thing to do would be to uh, back to the OI value information. DNA. Yeah, it hasn't gotten that far yet. Well, you're, you're close. Though. I'm close. I know. You, yeah. you, you could say you basically say, yeah. um, "Hey, listen, I don't need to waste my time sticking the needle in one five two. Yeah. Where there's uncertainty right now is 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 two oh one. Right. And that's what put my my electrodes to some, yeah. not waste time one five two. Yeah. It's right. about that. Yeah. And that's where like you know Stephanie's work the plug in directly. Yeah. yeah. The same. You're using the Hungarian algorithm, right, for matching. Right. Yeah. So, Interactive. Yeah. 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 So correspondence. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, that's, we're still building towards that, but like this is just the first step. Yeah. Okay, so then I'm going to tell you about um, the S cell network. And, uh, and, and so, so we've known about this for a long time. And so one of the cells that, you could, that are part of this table is part of the preparatory network is uh, this cell called the S cell. And uh, it's really interesting because it's 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 one of the few cells that are not bilaterally paired. So most cells have bilateral pairs, um, but it also forms this like electrically coupled network that goes up and down the entire length of the animal. So every S cell has this huge axon that's electrically coupled to every other S cell up and down the length of the animal, and so it's been characterized as like a giant fiber system. Okay. And so the hypothesis is that the S cell is, is mediating the preparatory network, right? So that the distal stimuli come, are coming in through this giant fiber system, activating the preparatory network to get the animal ready to produce behaviors. OK, so then we can use the voltage dyes to kind of like answer this question. And so uh, fortunately, the S cell, you can actually you can identify it just with electrophysiology. It has uh, these really big, uh, really skinny action potentials. Um, and so in, in, this, in this particular experiment, I like, ran a swim. I, I identified a couple cells. And then I found the S cell. Um, and then I targeted the S cell with an electrode. And I just excited it while also recording the rest of the ganglion with the voltage dyes, right? OK, so then I'm just like, passing this like square wave of current into the S cell. So that's just the actual, this is the optical recording of the S cell. And then you can see like a bunch of cells getting depolarized and a bunch of cells getting hyperpolarized in response to this S cell stimulus. And it turns out that um, these three cells are also part of the preparatory network, right? And so this is like, you know, this is just, exploring for the SL connections, and it, and it seems like the SL is likely connected to a handful of, of other preparatory cells. And then we can verify this by, again, so here's like a different way of identifying preparatory cells. So if you remember, like a lot of the preparatory cells had this uh, pink phase during this local bin behavior. So this is just like the, one of the easiest behaviors to do to identify it. So it's like the simple experiment. So then with this, we can identify AP 155 and 153, which are all part of the preparatory network. And then I can then go in with electrophysiology and, and actually do the intracellular recordings to verify that the synapses are real. And so, so, so you can see like the S cell to the AP cell, where the AP cell is this kind of the mother of the preparatory network. You can see like this one for, four, for one EPS piece from S to AP. And then the same, and then the S cells can also connect to 155, another preparatory neuron. It's weakly connected to 153, and then you can see that it has no connections to these to these other two cells in the same area, but that are not part of the preparatory network. <clears throat> so then here's kind of just like the summary. So this their cell body is kind of spread out like this through the ganglion. Um, we have the S cell, which is going to be forming this 
uh, electrical giant fiber system with the other ganglia in the animal. Um, and then, you know, sensory evoked stimuli are going to come into either anterior or posterior through this S cell network, activate the S cell, which in turn activates the rest of the preparatory network, or like these local sensory cells are going to activate the preparatory network directly, and that also activate the S cell, which likely sends this information to the rest of the to the rest of the animal. These last three slides. So, can you um, summarize what about the techniques and analyses for, for visualization uh, and identifying cell types helped you, one, get to identify a preparatory network, confirm it, and then do links between like AP and, and the preparatory network? What about visualizations helped you with that that you couldn't have done without the visualizations? Well, so mostly I rely on the visualizations more than the actual algorithms like for the matching. Like it, the visualizations are simple enough, especially because I'm not really looking at all 10 dimensions because like the cells that I've targeted are, are you, can, you can just do like one local bend to like identify 155 instead of having to do all the behaviors. So just like getting a visualization like, like for me now, I've seen you know enough swim activity maps that like I can just look at it and know exactly what cells it are. So, so just like the training on the visualizations. Like getting used to the system that you built. Yeah. That helped you recognize the, identify, formulate this idea of a preparatory network. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And, and, then, and then the links to, to, to explore it further in terms of um, the, the SL What would it have taken to get to these conclusions and insights without going doing the, the investment in advance and right. like visualization and uh, matching cell detection? Yeah, I mean, well, like doing just doing the mapping like was important for finding a preparatory network because because then I, I really was starting to see that like a lot of these cells, you know, were really similar and that, that they shared these features, and then that that pr prompted me to go look at them much more closely. Do you think uh, like zoning, like during the matching phase, kind of zoning into a set of candidate matches help? You know, for instance, inst I mean, yes. you know, instead of you trying to match across all, randomly across the animal, or you know, I mean, just saying that, all right, these are the few candidates. Yeah. That, do you think that was any helpful at all? Yeah, I think, I mean, yes, I think like being able to see the, the, the distances. So, so like I'll click on a cell and then you can see, I think that does help, that helps a lot. And, and, and a lot of times it, it will. Uh, You're using your head to boost space. Right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. And, and, it, and a lot of times it will point out a cell that you weren't even expecting. Because like, cause there's, there's one cell 232, which, you know, it, 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 it can be like almost anywhere up and down this central packet. Yeah. And, and at first, I, it took me a long time to realize that it was there. But then I, I started seeing it, and then it started like you know, highlighting it to me. And then I was able to visually like, really confirm it. Um, yeah, so right. So here's just kind of the, the overview of, of the computational microscope and how I applied it to mapping the leech's nervous system. Um, so, so we have like. We have these now automated techniques, which uh, which can uh, you know extract signals from raw imaging data uh, uh, without really much user in input, and then we can make uh, these activity maps or visualization and, and and put them together into some kind of canonical space, and then we can we can map out the function of of a bunch of the cells. Make these canonical maps for future reference, and uh, and then we can kind of use these tools to to ask new questions and and uh, kind of ask these do these experiments, which which are at a whole another scale that we we could never really do before. Um, and then I kind of want to tell you like this other, you know, what, what we've been doing with uh, the Brain Initiative, and we've 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 been trying to 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 try like 
kind of fully characterize this nervous system. And, and so like everything I've showed you, right, was on one face of the ganglion. So it's really I'm only imaging half the ganglion. But, but our collaborators uh, have now built a new microscope that has a, essentially an objective on top and on the bottom. And, and I went out there and helped them set this up. And now we can, we can literally image from every single cell in the ganglion all at once. Um, and so, so, so now we can like record from the entire nervous system. They're in uh, Cincinnati now. Daniel just, Daniel just started his lab in Cincinnati about two years ago. And that is Daniel's postdoc. I see. And what's known about the other half of the, of the sphere? Uh, no, there's, there's quite a bit known. I mean, it's kind of like the same, it's the same thing. Room, but it's kind of like another implication. Yeah. Like it's like the motor neurons in this. I mean, there, there are more motor neurons on the other side. And it's actually kind of like, I think like Bill and Otto Friesen agreed in the 1960s that they would like, one would do the ventral side and one would do the dorsal side. So, but, but so yeah, so it's, I mean, it's like kind of similar. It's about, you know, a third of the cells, mostly the large kind of motor neurons that are, that are known. Um, uh, there aren't quite as many cells on the other side either. Cause, cause, so you can see this. So this like stripe down the middle. This is uh, this is actually the connective. So like the axons coming in from the other ganglia and going through yeah, go Daniel through this was, connective. Was your lab for a while, right? Yeah, Daniel's a postdoc in Bill's lab. Yeah. 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 yeah, he was still there when I started. Yeah, he was just leaving. So we have this, and then we have um, my. Uh, graduate student colleague Jason in Bill's lab, uh, we're working on uh, getting the uh, uh, serial block face EM reconstruction of the leech. So, so if, you've, if you guys have heard of the connectome, the connectome stuff, this is like how you do the connectome. So, so our dream has always been to like image the ganglion, image all these behaviors, and then take the same ganglion and, 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 and get the EM connectome so that we can relate the function of all the neurons with the structure and anatomy. And, and so the EM is just amazing. You know, you can see these like nanometer resolutions. This is, yeah, these are, this is, this is leech EM, yeah. Just like look how complicated it is. This is so incredible. And it's like, here, just if you're an AI guy, like this cell makes, makes like 17 synaptic connections to this other cell. Just one cell, 17 different synapses, yeah, so. Yeah, you need more than one. You need like 17. <laughs> and then uh, we were also working with, uh, with Larry Abbott on uh, doing some computational modeling. So he, yeah, so he has these, uh, these recurrent neural networks that can produce these patterns. And so we're trying to consolidate all this data into a, a single framework of there at Col uh, Columbia. Um, yep, and so then I just want to, you know, thank everyone. This is the lab, and then my advisor Bill. Um, and it's like thank Kevin Brigman who gave, you know, a lot of input at the beginning of this project. Um, Shish and Eric, yeah. and then uh, Roger Chen's lab for the voltage dyes, and, and then that's my committee. Um, so if you guys have any questions, I'm be happy to answer. Them. Those last three, three or four slides, do, do those folks, uh, are they intrigued by, by the computational microscope and visualization ideas? They, or are they just going off in other directions? They seem to be used to those tools. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think they are. And I, I think, uh, 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 you know, it, it's kind of like another step, you know, like after, after we kind of, uh, define the canonical space with the mapping, you know, the next step is it would be to like make, take the data and make a model from it and, 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 and kind of incorporate uh, like the dynamics and, and the, the models too. I love this other brain squinting at the heart <laughs> problems here, heart questions. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah. it's, uh, I tell you, it's, 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 it's very, very exciting to see uh, how, how far you came from the internship project. Yeah. To, uh, Real world impact, and uh, um, I have to say, I've, I've seen a bunch of uh, B R A I N acronym initiative 
studies, but you know, even though this is not a simple system, this seems like it's making probably most progress in terms of understanding what's going on. Yeah. What, so what one comment here is like what it says to me about even leeches is that it's pretty clear that the fabric that upon which we're perceiving and thinking now is based on this, you know, some derivative of this, this, this uh, these these earlier systems, earlier per evolutionary tree. Yeah. And it's it's hard to know whether or not uh, the insights that will come out of these tools uh, directly apply, but certainly the tools will apply to understanding the water systems. This one comment I put like that excites me about the besides even understanding, you know, what, what these systems are doing. Mm -hmm. Always excites me as to the fact that, you know, we're listening, hearing and seeing based on these same kinds of networks. To the, um, to the unseasoned eye or microscope or, or computational microscope was about the same. <laughs> Close up. <laughs> yeah. <that's true. laughs> anyway. Any other questions or comments? Well, thanks a lot again. Thanks guys. <laughs>